Hey everyone, I'm Jay Withrow, and I'm so glad you're here because this is part one of a series I've greatly desired to produce, and it's all about what I think is one of the most exciting and important developments in church worship right now, and that is multilingual worship. Knowing how to do multilingual worship well is a skill that's becoming more and more crucial because churches are growing ever more ethnically diverse as you're probably very aware, and I'm sure that's why you're here, because you're trying to lead multilingual worship or you're about to jump into it. Uh, but that's an amazing place to be because um, there's such a huge scriptural precedent for it. And it's an incredible witness uh, to the community, to the neighborhoods around, to the power of Christ and the gospel as they hear multiple languages, but all being sung together, right? The picture of the, of the church in Revelation, all singing around the throne with one voice. And so just so you know a little bit more about my involvement in this over the years, I've been leading multilingual worship for about 10 years. And normally we have three languages represented in our services, but every now and then we'll have five or even more. And so all that experience has just taught me a ton and I'm wanting to share that all with you. So I'm really excited to help as much as I can through the series. So let's dive in. So the first step in creating a multilingual worship set would be team planning. And, uh, and that's the first step, and that's what I'm going to go over in this video. But in future videos in this series, I'll also cover music arranging, how to display lyrics and graphics, what to do for a rehearsal and for the actual leading. So, uh, you know, look out for those as well if you need those specific aspects. But let's go ahead and dive into this. There's four major steps to this. First is just getting your team together. How do you get together? Well, it should first of all be in person, if at all possible. The second step will be uh, sharing the vision. How do you share that and make it clear for why you'd wanna have multiple languages as opposed to just a single language? The third step would be discussing the needs and the actual details of each language represented. And then finally, the fourth step is with your team selecting the order of service. So let's start with that first step, getting the team together. Make it face-to-face. -face. Anytime you're dealing with uh, folks who might not speak your language very well, face-to-face -face is always the best option. If you can't, of course, stick to a video chat, but make sure you can see one another in some way. And then do this with plenty of time to spare. I found that in my context, which is in my church, we have three languages oftentimes represented, which is English, Spanish, and a language called Kaya, which is spoken by the Karini people from Myanmar. And with us, when we were first starting, I found that one month lead time was a good amount of time for us to actually figure out and hammer out all the details. Whereas I was normally spending only one week with a single language service. So we made it a full month or four weeks ahead. And if this is a special event that you're putting on where maybe people are coming from out of state or in a different, from a different region or country, give even more time. If this is a big you know, international thing, give six months or more of lead time to start having these questions asked, figuring out the details and really hammering it out and that will be amazing for you. So after you've gotten everyone together, the first thing you need to do is pray. And don't just make this a rote thing. Really understand the scriptures, what God says and promises about our prayers, that if we pray with trust, right, that there is power and it's effective when we pray, right? He wants us to uh, ask for his will. And if you go into this thinking, it's just, ah, I just gotta pray because I've got to, then even if it feels like things are, are working well, it's not gonna have the eternal fruit that we desire it might not be doing anything because Jesus says, if you don't abide in him, you can do nothing. So if your lack of prayer is showing that you're not appropriately abiding in Christ, then that there might be some not so good consequences uh, for that. So make sure your heart is right, the team's heart is right, ask for the Lord's leading, and then go in confidence and trust that he's gonna guide your creative processes and decisions in this. Then you want to start sharing the vision for why you're having multiple languages. This goes beyond just the vision for why you're getting together. There might be other reasons, but you need to have a vision for specifically multiple languages. I found that when we first started to do this in my church that people were kind of hesitant or people thought it was difficult or even certain leaders, it seemed like they were like, why do this? And we had to nail it down 
And it wasn't just because we thought it was cool. It's got to be way more than just our feelings. It has to come from Scripture, I think, Scripture itself. And so for our church, we hinge our vision for multilingual worship on two main passages of Scripture. The first one is from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. It says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then the second scripture that we hinge things on is John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So that first uh, passage from Revelation, we talk about uh, this is the picture that the Bible gives us of how it will be before the throne. All tribes, tongues, and nations gathered around. And then that's why we're doing it in our service. It's a very picture of the very thing that we know the Lord wants. And that is a powerful testimony to our churches and to the community at large who might be witnessing this to what God is doing and what he is up to and what he cares about. And that second passage from the book of John, that's Jesus' prayer to the Father, and it reveals that belief, right? The belief that people have can hinge upon the unity that Christians show. He's wanting that oneness, that unity, so that the world may believe that the Father sent Jesus. That's a huge deal, and we can push that forward as the vision for why we're doing multilingual worship, singing in multiple languages, while also singing the same songs and being a part of the same worship service is a clear picture and I think helps usher in the very thing Jesus is praying for. So these are some major scriptural precedents and you can share this with your leaders and make sure your people, the different language groups, have an understanding of this as well. Once you've gone through those things, you can actually get into the more nitty gritty details and start hammering things out. Something that you would begin to ask about that you wouldn't if you were just doing a single language service is what are the language needs and details? The first question about that I would ask is, you gotta figure out what the languages are. What are the native languages being spoken there? Everybody's first language. What are they and then what percentages are they? And then you have to ask, is there a secondary language or a common language that would be the majority language everyone could understand. For us, our percentages at my church, about 80% English is their first language and they understand that perfectly. 10% Spanish, 10% speaking Kaya. And of the Kaya speakers, probably half or more of them, they also grew up speaking English. So it's basically a first language as well, Kaya and English. And then for our Spanish speakers, even though English wasn't their first language, they still understand it. So the majority language for us, 95% of people can speak English and understand it. So that's why we choose for us to do most things like our sermons and our communications, our announcements in English. And then we have translations in the other languages as we have need. So find out what those percentages are, what those languages are for you, and it will help you make these decisions about who will translate and how you're going to do it. So the next step after you've identified the languages is, are there unique scripts for these languages? Something that for us is not Roman characters, right? English and Spanish are both uh, written or typed in Roman characters. So it's easy to do that. We don't have to change font styles or anything. But for Kaya, that language, I don't know anything about it. I don't know it. I didn't have the font face for it. Just nothing was there. And so that all took a lot of time and takes way more effort because it's not just a copy and paste thing. You've really got to take extra time with it. So consider that and consider how many languages you have that might have unique scripts. And then after you know if there's a unique script, if there is, you've got to ask, well, do the speakers of that language, can they actually read it? That was an issue we had, that was a pitfall, is for two years we created, spent countless hours creating this special unique script to go alongside English and the other languages on the screen and come to find out that most people 
couldn't even read it, only a small handful. But what most people needed who spoke Kaya, what they needed was a transliteration of the Kaya language. And if you're unfamiliar with that, a transliteration is simply taking words that are in one script and then making them legible in a different script so that the speakers of that other language can pronounce the words. Even if they don't understand what they're saying, they can at least pronounce it because it's in their familiar script. So that's how we needed it in Kaya. It's great for choirs because choirs have to sing everything no matter what language. So they need a transliteration for it. So figure out those things and then it will keep you from making mistakes that bog down the process that you find out later. Oh, we've got to do this, right? All right, so the next question would be, well, now that we've got these details and we know about the scripts, is there a particular language that we need to preach in? And for us, normally it is the majority language, but you might have a special guest speaker and they're going to speak no matter what language. <laughs> and then you have to decide, okay, is it worth doing that with the way that we want it to be translated? And that would be the next question is, well, how will we translate whoever is going to be speaking the sermon or whatever is being spoken during the service time. There's really three ways that you have translation. One is you actually have someone up on the stage beside the speaker translating in real time. Two, you have someone in a separate room who's listening on headphones and then they're speaking to a different group that's isolated, you know, acoustically in a separate room. And so you do it that way. Or do you wanna keep everyone in the same room but uh, have some kind of translation system with uh, transmitters and receivers where people can listen on headphones? Or do you wanna have like an app where they just pull out their phone and they can use their own Bluetooth headphones to listen to it? Although that takes some money, normally those are subscription services, right? Those are kind of your three options. And so let's talk about why you might choose one over the other. Well, the first one, right, just having someone up standing beside the speaker on stage speaking is certainly the simplest. It doesn't really take any money or any special systems to do that. You just have to have someone who's skilled in that. And if they are, well, the, the cost of this is that it's going to double the amount of time it takes the sermon uh, to be given because the speaker has to say it, then the translator also has to say it. You gotta give time for that and it doubles the amount of time. It also makes it a little awkward for the speaker I've found is most people are not used to pausing and it interrupts their flow, their thought process. And so that can be difficult for some speakers if they're not used to that. I would say if that is the option that you're going with, for sure make sure the translator has gotten the sermon notes so that they have time to go over any special uh, special translations between scriptures that are maybe read or certain idioms that or jokes that person giving the sermon might have or that they might know ahead of time. And then that makes things so much smoother, I've found, for the translator. So the last step of creating this multilingual service in the planning phase, I would say, is to actually select the order of service with your team. Now, you might think, oh, this is really gonna change because we're doing multiple languages. Well, really, I found the order of service doesn't need to change at all. You can still have the same service elements. You know, let's say you have a scripture reading and three songs and then a prayer. I mean, you can do everything the same as far as order and even time-wise, it's pretty much the same. But what really changes, of course, is how each of those elements is actually communicated. That's the major change. And that's where you're really making these, these big uh, decisions. And so let me just kind of hit some of these, you know, different service elements that you might have, starting with one of the easier ones, which would be just scripture readings. With scripture readings, there's different ways that we've done it that we like to do it. One is just to have someone read it in their language, and then on the screen, you have it in the common language or all the other languages that might be in your service so that people can hear it in one language and then read it and all the rest. Another way is you have maybe multiple languages, like people who can read different languages standing side by side, each taking a turn on a mic, reading a couple scriptures, and then you get to hear all these languages uh, being spoken. That's oftentimes how we have, you know, five or more languages in our service is scripture readings. And that's really beautiful to hear maybe a, a language that maybe one or two people in your congregation might speak. Like we have Bulgarian and Japanese and some of these, uh, languages that only a few people speak, but then they get to read it and it and it touches them if that's their first language. And that's really important, I think, to have, especially if, if you're planning these kinds of things in an ongoing, long-term way in your church. 
Uh, one other thing I want to mention about scripture readings that we ran into, you got to make sure if it's a, a language that's not well known, or maybe hasn't had Christianity very long in that culture, they might not have all the scriptures translated. In Kaya, they didn't have the whole Old Testament. It's still being translated to this day at the making of this video. So make sure that they actually have all the scriptures that you want read and that you're planning for. Another service element is prayers. How can we do prayers? Uh, in my particular tradition, we do a lot of extemporaneous prayers where we're just delivering them off the cuff. They haven't been premeditated necessarily. They haven't been written down. And we find that it's just easiest for the flow of the prayer to not have to do any translation on that. We just allow people, if they can't understand it, they can pray in their hearts, or maybe we have prayer points up on the screen so that everyone can be praying in a unified way, but we just let the prayer pray in their language. If you do have written down prayers, um, of course, you can handle it just the way you do a scripture reading. You could have translations up on a screen while someone reads it in their language. Um, something else that we've done prayer-wise, I will say, uh, just as it comes to mind, is we do what's called a mass prayer, where everybody in the whole building prays in their language out loud. Everybody. That's really cool because it, it, it harkens back to Pentecost, right? Where all the apostles are speaking in different languages and people are hearing them. So that can be really amazing if uh, you're comfortable doing that kind of thing. And that's something I had to ease into, and we really enjoy it now that we are comfortable with that. The last service element I'm going to talk about today in this video is songs. And of course, that is the one most people are most interested in. That's what usually takes the longest. And that's because you can't, it's just not just some quick translation you're doing. You're also having to think about how many syllables and, and is this a great way to poetically translate this. You can't just do some quick literal translation when it comes to songs. There's melody lines to consider. And so there's a lot more effort that goes into translating songs. So the first question you have to ask with this and your team has to decide, are we going to have multiple languages within each song? Or maybe just one song will have multiple languages. Or maybe other songs will, you can just do an entire song in one language. And then the next song is just done in one language. That's certainly simpler than having multiple languages in one song, for sure, because you don't have to create any sort of custom arrangement. But I would say the power of a multilingual worship service in the singing comes when you have multiple languages in one song, because you're singing one song, it's unified, and then you hear the different languages. It really uh, hits that vision, right? We talked about from the book of Revelation and for Jesus' prayer about unity. It seems to encapsulate that and, and present that in a clearer, more powerful way. I think. So I think it's worth spending the time on it to have uh, multiple translations in one song. If you're going to go that route, there's really two options you have. The simplest option is just finding or picking songs that already have translations. You don't have to do any work. It's already been done for you by other people, other artists, and then you can just mix and match the verses and choruses as, as you need. And that's, that's definitely the simplest way. The more complex way which is what I really like to do, but it's taken some time to get our process down for it, is to have custom translations that have never had, trans, you know, songs have never had translation before, and now we're gonna put it into English, Spanish, and Kaya. And if you're gonna do that, think about this, you have to have someone who's skilled and creative enough to do that. They're basically songwriting. Okay, they have to have an understanding of melody. They need to be able to sing. They've got to be able to select the certain amount of syllables. They've got to have a, a good enough understanding of both languages to feel like they truly captured the idea that's being represented uh, by, the, by each language. And so that takes a special person. Well, if you've identified that person and have them and you've never done it before, maybe start slow, just one song. Try one chorus that way and have them try to translate it and create a version. Uh, in their language. And then as you get good at it, you could do more, do a verse in a chorus, do a bridge, do multiple songs. And that's what we found has worked with us uh, well, is to take it slow and ramp it up, especially if you're going for the long term on a multilingual worship set for your church. Do make sure though, that your team knows how much time it's going to take to make custom translations. Okay, if you're planning this and they're thinking that you know, they'll oftentimes assume things are gonna take just as long as it normally does for just a one language service or translation. And that 
Couldn't be further from the truth. So make it really clear that guys, we're gonna be spending triple or quadruple the amount of time to make this. So give us a lot of extra grace. Don't get mad at us if we're not getting back super fast on these things, because it's just gonna take a while. And then that will help with their expectations. We have found that that really smooths it out when we make it super clear. And as far as other elements that might be present in a service like communion or announcements or other things, you can decide how important those are or how involved they're going to be for your particular service or event. And then you can treat it, each of those elements, just like a sermon maybe, or like you would treat a scripture reading or even a song, right? Let's say you're singing during a communion time and you can make those decisions now based on what you know from the other service elements we've talked about. Well, y'all, that's what I have for this video. I hope it has been really helpful to you. Maybe it brought up something or some question and you're like, oh man, I'm glad I got through that. If it did, let me know. Maybe there's other questions you have. Leave it in the comments. I would love for myself and our community to be able to respond to those. Maybe there's certain uh, ways you do translation that are out there, maybe certain apps that you're using. I'd love to know about that. We could all benefit from it. And um, yeah, I hope you stick around for the series. Next uh, video, I'm gonna dive into music arrangements. I'm gonna show you how I create the songs with these custom arrangements and get way deep into that. Well, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate your support and I'm so glad you're wanting to embark into multilingual worship. Well, I'll see you at the next video. Have a good one.